Good afternoon. We've got, uh, got, got one more talk in you. It's, we just have one more talk before to close the meeting out. I have the, the uh, honor of introducing our last speaker, Michael Neff. I'll tell you to, a few things about Michael to, to get things going. He got his, both his BS and his uh, PhD at the University of Washington. We, we try not to hold that against him. He's, his, his, it, I think the reasoning behind it was he really fell in love with the Puget Sound after he moved to the west side and spent a lot of time in the water. After uh, his PhD, he did a postdoc at the Salk Institute, and then he started his uh, career as a, as a professor at Washington University where he had to sail his sailboat up and down the Mississippi. Um, like a lot of university plant biologists, he's, he makes a lot of transgenic plants. If, he, if he's working on a piece of DNA, he thinks is a gene and, and don't, not sure that, need to prove what it actually does, you make a transgenic plant. So he has a lot of experience, 20 years of experience with making transgenic plants. Because of this expertise, and uh, you know, he's, he's a pretty entertaining speaker. He's, he's a real popular speaker to talk about this topic, and he's done it quite a bit. Um, it is kind of a lightning rod of a, of a topic, really. So if, if when you're listening uh, and you don't agree, go ahead and just, just tell him, tell the people next to you. I mean, Mike, Michael's used to this sort of thing. If you're really offended and you need to leave, just go ahead and stomp and <laughs> slam the door on the way out. He, he's he's used happened. to that, too. It's so. happened before. <laughs> yeah. So it won't be the first time. Um, yeah, get, OK, and you get a picture of it, yeah. The, uh, with that, I'll, uh, Michael, go ahead and. OK, remind the, the credits oh, right here. Uh, right there. Yeah, oh yeah, there's pesticide credits in the, on the, back, in table. the back over there. Okay, yeah, we're good to go, Scott. It's okay. all queued up. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Actually, I think that's one of those horrible questions to ask because if anyone can't hear you, they can't say no, right? They don't know to say no. Um, all right, so I've, I've given this talk to over 3,000 people in the last three years around the Pacific Northwest. Uh, actually gave this almost exact same talk two, week, no, two months ago in this room to Crop Production Services, which is the group that got me started. Actually, they were the first group that I spoke to, and uh, it's gone viral, I guess, since then. So I'd like to thank anyone here from Crop Production Services. I want to thank you guys for, for um, getting me going on this, and I want to thank all of you for staying. You know, you could leave now and uh, listening to... Uh, this story that I have to tell about transgenic crops and the methods and pros and cons of, of GMO and biotechnology. I'm, I'm, when I am telling you what my personal opinion is, I'm going to try very hard to make it clear that that's my opinion versus scientific knowledge or facts. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, let's start with what is GMO. And GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism. Uh, and it's one whose genetic material or DNA has been changed using the techniques of DNA or RNA-based editing, uh, genetic engineering. Um, and this includes bacteria, yeast, mammals, insects, fish, and plants. So all of these are organisms can be genetically engineered. And this is with DNA that could be from that organism or from a different organism, okay? Uh, GMO foods are GMO. GMO is not defined by cloning, though that may be involved, and GMO is not defined by breeding, though that may be involved as well. In fact, often cloning and breeding are a part of, of GM production. Um, it's not specific to genetic changes done through sexual or asexual reproduction, which would be breeding or cloning. Okay, so here's some examples of, this is a new slide. I, um, of, of, these are from bacteria or E. coli that have been genetically engineered, and these are examples that touch our lives um, on a daily basis. So if I ask, and I often do this in the room, I say, how many people here, let's say we'll play the, how many degrees of free, from Kevin Bacon, you know, how, it's like two, two people away from you, you know, you know someone who knows someone that either has cancer or is a recovering, recovering from fighting cancer or is insulin dependent diabetic. Generally, I think if we raised our hands, almost every person in the room has been touched by cancer or diabetes 
in their family or their friends. And so um, in this first case with human insulin, uh, uh, human insulin now can be expressed in bacteria and this is used for insulin dependent diabetes. Before this genetic engineering occurred, insulin was harvested from pigs and dogs. And so when I say harvested, I meant, mean that the animal was killed and then the insulin was purified from those individuals. And then that was used to treat, treat humans that were diabetic, insulin dependent diabetic. But um, some humans would have an allergic reaction to that uh, insulin from a dog or a pig. And then that's essentially a fatal, a fatal situation because you can't treat uh, their diabetes. Um, and it's also so much safer, no allergic reaction. And um, actually, you know, you think about it, if somebody was a vegetarian and they uh, were insulin dependent diabetic, then they couldn't treat their disease when it was relied on insulin from dogs or, or pigs. In the case of Taxol, this is an extremely effective uh, drug for fighting different cancers. And uh, Taxol came from the Pacific yew tree. That's where it was originally isolated, from the cambium layer, the living cell dividing layer underneath the bark of the yew tree. And the problem is, is that you have to kill the tree in order to isolate the Taxol. And so without some form of either being able to synthesize Taxol in the laboratory or genetically engineering bacteria, eventually we're not going to have any Pacific yew trees and then we're not going to have any Taxol. And so, um, and the more important thing is that by being able to make the precursor to Taxol in bacteria, then uh, chemists can start working on developing new ver versions or variants of Taxol that are more effective for treating certain cancers. Uh, vitamins, lots of vitamins that are used to fortify uh, cereal are actually pr produced in bacteria. And uh, that's because it's cheaper and, and it's easier to purify and you have a very pure form. And we're gonna come to this in about two slides when we talk about GMO-free Cheerios. And then the last one, this is a really cool one, is this enzyme called chymosin. It's a protease. And, and it comes from rennet. And rennet comes from the lining of calf stomachs. Okay, so without being able to make chymosin in bacteria, you have to harvest your calves and harvest the stomach lining and then use that to separate the, the curd from the whey when you make hard cheeses. So basically 80 to 90% of the hard cheeses that are made in the United States have genetically modified uh, chymosin that's used in the production of that cheese. Um, and that's interesting because, you know, if you're going to, if really, if you're going to be getting your rennet from calf stomachs, then that's also a vegetarian issue. Right? And a lot of us eat cheese. Um, okay, so these are just some of these uh, examples from bacteria. Okay, really important. This is a very, very important point. One of the take home messages I want you guys to get, which is that GMO does not include Photoshop. All right, and for example, here is horrible, right? I mean, what else can you say? Uh, why here? Now, here's my personal opinion. Why is somebody doing this? Well, it could be because they want to show how good they are at Photoshop, but my personal opinion is that the person who made this picture is trying to scare people away from GMOs. Um, and I've got a couple other examples. This comes from the Seattle Organic Restaurant's uh, uh, Vegan Whole Foods web, web page when we were going through voting for the labeling initiative in the state of Washington, these are the types of images that the organic restaurant groups were put, posting online. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but somehow by eating stuff that you turn into something horribly mutant. Uh, just to point out here, needles are often used in these pictures. Well, here's a really nice one. Uh, and we don't use needles at all when we generate transgenic plants. So on Facebook, I'll go on there and say, you know, we know, do we say, make a statement like that? And then someone says, well, um, these needles are there because it represents the fact all these people that are diabetic because they're eating too much genetically modified high fructose corn syrup. And so that's why I'm, I'm not going to take this picture down. Um, and I could mention the, the, in, the insulin that is used to treat diabetes. Then I give up. I mean, at that point, I just, I really, there, I, I don't get a lot of uh, pleasure out of arguing on the internet. Um, so I try not to do that. These, you know, these sort of images, are you still feeding your baby with GMOs, as if that's a horrible, horrible thing to do. And, and then this image here is actually in some of the G GM technology, what we're trying to do is reduce the use of certain herbicides or insecticides that are so toxic that you have to wear clothes like this in order to apply them. So there's some irony here. Uh, in January 2014, so a year ago, 
the original Cheerios went GMO free, not the honey nut, just the original one, all right? And, and so they did this, I think, as a, this is my opinion, I don't know exactly why, but perhaps as a marketing ploy to continue to get people to buy Cheerios or to encourage more people to buy Cheerios. But the irony there is that when these Cheerios went GMO free, they had to stop fortifying it with certain vitamins because those vitamins sometimes are produced by bacteria. So the reality is that the GMO free or Cheerios are actually less healthy than the GM Cheerios. Um, splitting hairs maybe, but you know, these are things that we need to think about. This one was uh, Oregon, the Yes on 37 was uh, the labeling initiative in, in California, which did not pass just like it didn't pass here and just like it didn't pass in Oregon. And so this sign, this, this has been used a lot of times. These are apparently GMO corn seeds and these are normal corn seeds. And of course, which would you choose? The ones that are blue that you have to handle with a glove or, or the normal ones? Well, then I get on Facebook and I said, well, you know, actually that's just because those seeds are treated and, and you can treat seeds even if they're not GMO and then I get banned from that page. So, <laughs> so then I have to do talks like this, right? Okay. So, all right. Uh, this was, I moved to Washington State the second time when we came back to Washington State uh, in 2007. And after I arrived in Pullman, uh, just within a month or so, this was published in the Spokesman Review. And I'm, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but there's a lot of misinformation in here. And obviously this person hates Monsanto um, I can get, tell you that for sure. Um, and then here's, here's one thing that we, I do want to read. Consumers should wake up and realize that not all science is beneficial to us. More autisms and brain disorders are diagnosed yearly in our children. Why? Cancer finds its stronghold in all ages with no cure or prevention. Who profits from this? So this is implying that GM causes cancer and that GM causes autism and, and that corporations are doing this because they don't care about us and they want to make a lot of money. So I... Um, I, it's like, look here, right? picture grotesque mutant humans born, we are what we eat. I think that this person wrote this letter because he or she has been swayed by the type of images that are out there. Um, and so it's, it, this is why I give this talk, because I want to I wanna talk about what's, what is the truth versus what people think might be the case. Um, my wife's an oncology nurse. She's not here today, but she gave me this slide recently. And what this shows is, this is age-adjusted uh, cancer death rates in the United States. And this one is for men uh, between 1930 and uh, 2010. The very similar results for women, though in the case of women, uh, lung cancer took a little longer to start declining because they started smoking uh, later and then stopped smoking uh, later than men did. But look right here. This, so, uh, this box is the, represents the time period when GM crops have been in production, so from 1996 on. So first of all, actually, what that person wrote before, you know, implying that cancer's death rates are increasing, they're actually decreasing. Um, and uh, so I guess one of the, there's another take-home message that I want to get across today, and that is this statement, the correlation does not equal causation. And so part of what the person in that letter was implying is we've had increased GM production during this amount of time and there's been more autism and, well, more or less cancer. That's, uh, but, and, and so it must be caused by the increase in GM. Though at the same time we've had, you know, digital cameras and smartphones and hybrid cars and laptops and, and all of these things could be causing autism. And, but we have, no, we have no way to make a scientific model for how well, you could. I mean, if you pick up, get in a new car, you smell, it's that new car smell is volatile organic compounds, and they may be the problem, right? But then we have to come up with models to how do these correlations really, are they really linked? Here's a great web page I encourage people to go to. This guy, Tyler Vegan, loves to collect data sets and then run them through a computer program and just see what data set can, correlates with another one. And so here we have, um, this up here is, this is the people who died by strangulation, uh, through being tangled with their bed sheets, really perfectly correlates with money generated by skiing facilities. And then, the, but those bed sheet strangulation deaths also correlate with the uh, uh, per capita consumption of cheese, which by the way is made with chymosin that's been. Um, 
Okay, so, and, and then uh, just two more, and I'm going to show you one more after this, but there's tons of them. You, I just can collect. They're just fun to look at. This is divorce rate in Maine correlating with per capita consumption of margarine. So as we consumed less and less margarine, people stayed married. That's awesome. Um, and then here, one of my very favorites of all is this is honey producing bee colony. Decline in the United States has a beautiful inverse correlation with juvenile arrests for the possession of marijuana. Okay. So the last one I want to show is basically when someone walked out on me before, so I'm going to try and temper this. Uh, you might have seen this around too, but here is a really beautiful correlation between autism diagnoses and the sale of organic foods. Now, there is no, we have no model for how organic foods cause autism or how autism would cause people to be buying more organic foods. But this is just the, the, this is to illustrate the point that correlation does not equal causation, okay? All right, OMG, GMO. I really wish I had, had gotten a trademark on that one, but I didn't. You know, I should have, because you've heard me take this many times. Are you eating GM food? So, so since 1996, we've had a dramatic increase in GM crop production um, worldwide. So you can see in 96 was when the first traits were out in the field that were other than flavor saver tomatoes, basically Roundup Ready corn and, and BT corn and, and soybean. And so here's a, a list of some of the common crops that are likely to be GMO. We've got alfalfa, canola, corn, cotton, soy, sugar beets, some zucchini and yellow summer squash. These are disease resistance traits and papaya in Hawaii, and that's a disease resistance trait. Most of the time, what these GM uh, traits are, are either for weed or insect control or virus resistance. So um, primarily, bi essentially biotic stress, all right? Um, that's the stuff that's out there right now. And if we look at the, at the increase in some of these traits, HT means herbicide tolerance, BT means insect resistance, and so you can see that almost all of the soy being grown in the United States is uh, herbicide tolerance uh, over 90%. Uh, same with corn, and, and you've got cotton is in there as well. And actually, it's usually not just one trait now, but they're stacked, so these crops will have both insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. And I'm going to talk about both of those traits a little bit. I'm not going to go deep into the science, but I'll explain a bit about that, about each of these, as well as the papaya story we'll talk about at the end of this talk. So can you avoid eating GMO foods? Yes, and then you put in parentheses, sort of, because the U.S. organic definition is no GM ingredients, but really it's no known knowingly, right? So if somebody's GM pollen blows from one field into another, it's still into the organic field, it's still organic. Um, it's not, it doesn't prevent that person from selling that as organic. What they can't do is they can't knowingly add GM uh, to that field, okay? So um, it's obviously quite prevalent in our society and and we'll talk really a little bit about health. Let's actually just do it real quickly. We'll come back to that in a minute. There is another take home message I want to get across, which is that there is absolutely no credible, reproducible scientific evidence that GM causes cancer because it's GM. There is none. The papers that come out that try to imply this, uh, they've all been retracted or not reproduced. And you guys have probably heard about this study where people fed rats with GM corn and the rats had cancer and looked horrible. The control populations did as well. And they really were cherry picking their data. They could have picked data points where the, the GM fed rats were healthier than the control population. Um, but they didn't want to do that because that wasn't the point they were trying to make. And, and the, the population sizes in that, in that paper were so small that statistic you basically, you could see it go either way statistically. And on top of that, these are rats that get cancer at a very high rate to begin with. Um, so that's an example, and there's other examples. We have no evidence for this, all right? And if really it was true that GM was causing cancer and, all, and infertility and all these other problems, we would have seen it in our cattle. Because a lot of these GM crops are going to cattle feed. And the cattle are just as healthy now as they were before 1996. They're actually probably healthier because we're getting better at taking care of them. So, and, I, and oh, one other point, because people sometimes say that I work for Monsanto. I do not. Monsanto actually really tried hard to hire me, and I wouldn't go work there. I don't get any money from Monsanto, and I don't get any money to give this talk. 
There are people that go on Dr. Oz and the food, well, food babe, these people are getting paid to tell you how horrible these things are. I'm doing this because I need to. This is my extension, and I'm not being paid to do this. Okay, advances. So we've been growing a lot better, a lot higher yields and doing a better job of growing food on the planet. Um, and a lot of that has come from public funding and universities, like the land-grant universities, such as Washington State University and Oregon State University. Um, uh, the Green Revolution came from these types of, of public uh, groups, which is a combination of, of, of genetic, plant genetic material, semi-dwarf, high-yielding varieties, and changes in farming practice, practices and equipment. But we have some major challenges, and we've heard about that at this meeting. We have to feed more and more people with less or at least the same amount of arable land and really less because as we have more and more people, they have to live somewhere too. We have a, we have a very serious problem. Now the private sector has gotten into this recently, relatively recently, especially in developed countries like, such as the United States and not so much in developing countries. Now what these companies are doing is they're focusing on commercially viable approaches because the research costs are extremely expensive. And so they have to choose something that's going to be a major home run, like Roundup Ready Corn coupled with Roundup, okay? It takes 15 to 30 years for this, this type of work to actually start paying back the millions of dollars that went in. And that's why they're choosing, their companies need to be sustainable just like anyone else does. And in their case, they need to, their, their shareholders need to be happy and the company stays afloat. So, um, one of the ways that they protect this research is through intellectual property rights. And this is true also with all those other examples I gave of smart cars and, or whatever, smartphones and hybrid cars and everything, right? Um, that's business, that's just business. If, if everything's, a, if there's a, some trait that's out or idea that's out publicly out there and it's gonna cost you millions of dollars to put it into your pipeline, you're not gonna do it if everyone else can do that as well. So that's why they have what we call freedom to operate stock, I mean, patent portfolios. This can slow down and stop some agricultural research, not the fundamental stuff that we do in my lab. We can do all this work even though Monsanto might have a patent for a certain gene or a certain technology, but we can't go out and deploy it unless we actually pay for the rights to do that. So we can do the fundamental research. It's a little bit harder for us to get into the game and actually get something, some good idea out there. Like in my case, we're working on trying to make bigger seeds and that can be planted deeper in dry soils. That's not something that's gonna make Monsanto a lot of money, but it is something that's very relevant to you guys here in this room. So here's the big players, you know, there's quite a few of them and we've already mentioned Monsanto a couple times. I often give this talk to students at WSU and in classes and I love to say to them, you know, if this were a drinking game and you had to take a drink every time I say the word Monsanto, by the end of my hour, you'll be completely drunk as you will hear it a lot, so. Luckily, there's no beer here today, all right now. Um, you've certainly seen the bumper stickers, millions against Monsanto. These guys are the ones that people like to hate the most. Okay, so let's talk briefly about some of these IP claims. So one is plant germplasm. You have to have the right genetic material to start with. And we know this here because of the, how diverse agriculture is in the state of Washington and rainfall areas. There's different wheat that grow in high rainfall areas or irrigation versus those that grow in low rainfall areas. And so you need the right material. Um, and then there are these trait-specific input genes like Roundup Ready herbicide tolerance, BT-mediated insect re resistance, increasing yield either by making plants larger or semi-dwarf, and abiotic stress tolerance, disease resistance, cold tolerance. These are some of the things that companies are becoming interested in. And then there's trait-specific outputs such as altering the content of starch, oil, amino acids, proteins, vitamins, all these different things can be we can, and, and this is happening with, with oil, oil seeds, changing the oil profiles for better storage or better biodiesel usage. Um, also bioremediation, pulling uh, heavy metals and bad chemicals out of the soil. And biomass and biofuels are areas that people are thinking more about. And then enabling technologies. The technologies that we use to actually make the transgenic plants are also something that's patented. Okay, so why GM? I'm, what I'm trying, you know, I, one of the things I think is really important is that I can't make a blanket statement for or against. In fact, in general, I think it's very dangerous to just take a blanket stance on something. That it's important to have a discourse and it's important to think about on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So I am pro-GM, but I'm not pro-every GM idea out there. I think there's some really bad ones. And I'll give you guys an example of a bad one at the end of my talk. Um, OK, so people that are pro, though, generally think or believe that GM crops may be able to help contribute to increasing yield and food quality and agricultural sustainability. And I think there are examples where that is indeed the case. And then the con side is that GM crops may contribute to hurting us or the environment. Now, right now, there's absolutely no evidence that GMs are dangerous because they're GM. I could make something that expresses a poison, but that would be really stupid, right? Um, that, would be a, that would be a career killer, for sure, um, <clears throat> and not worth doing. Um, and, and there are examples when GM has led to hurting the environment, and we'll talk about that at the end of, at the, end of the talk. All right, so are GM foods safe? Well, you've heard me say, you know, to the best of our knowledge, that's the case. And I'm not the only scientist that is saying this. There's, this is a long list. This is basically a photograph of a poster that shows all of the organizations. And we don't, I don't need to read these, but they basically have said GM crops are as safe as their non-GM counterparts. And so let's just sort of scroll down the poster. Here we've got, uh, well, the American Medical Association and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, American Society of Plant Biology, I'm a member of them, uh, Crop Science Society of America, I'm a member of that group as well, American Microbiology Society, just goes down the list, and these are all groups that have come out and said, the GM, the consensus around the safety of genetically modified foods is as strong as a scientific consensus around climate change. I actually wish they hadn't put that last part in there because then that, you know, that might deflect the sort of discussion. But the bottom line is, is that it's, th there's no evidence that they're not safe. And this is based on science, okay? So, so there's, a, there's some links here. And if anyone's interested in my ha getting these PowerPoints, I'm more than happy to give them to you and give you pointers on how to give a talk like this. I'm, I'm happy to do that. This is extension for me. Um, so what do I mean by science? Let's do this really quickly. Somebody who is having trouble sleeping and they're unhappy and they're da, 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 and they don't feel good and, and so they decided to go and become vegetarian and stop drinking alcohol and quit smoking cigarettes and not eat GM food and exercise more and now they feel great and then their one story is, I feel great because I stopped eating GM food. That's not science. In fact, any one single anecdotal story is not science. Science is taking two groups, one with GM corn and one with the exact same corn but no genetically modified trait in there and then feeding it to groups and then seeing what happens and then, not, and then saying yes, there's a difference or there isn't a difference. And we're not seeing any evidence at all and people are doing these studies and some of these papers here are basically looking at many, many, many groups and many, 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 many what we call metadata analysis many groups that have looked at this and so here's one of those examples an overview of the last 10 years of genetically engineered crop safety research and right down here here's the important thing in their abstract the scientific research contributed so far has not detected any significant hazard hazards directly correlated with GE crops however the debate is still intense an improvement in the efficacy of scientific communication could have a, a significant impact on the future of agricultural GE that's why I'm here we need to have this conversation, okay? Pro-GM crops, all right. This is just to get this point across. I really think a blanket statement is dangerous. There are examples that are not good, and so we need to examine each on a case-by-case -case basis. But in order to do that, I mean, we have to be able to develop scientific knowledge to develop an opinion. And so we need to go and teach people about the science behind this. And, and not listen to somebody called Dr. Oz, by the way. Okay. Um, just be, yeah, all right, I'll leave it at that. Must be able to inform and educate the public based on each analysis. And we have to keep an open mind to all sides of the argument. You know, if I didn't have this pro-GM crops and just said anything there, this could be about any hot topic issue that we're debating. Um, and, and, you know, so basically this is, when I gave this talk before, it was right before Thanksgiving, and, the advice was, okay, let's not talk about anything at the Thanksgiving dinner table that's going to cause people to argue, right? Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the genetic engineering toolbox. All right, so we've got genes, and genes encode proteins or traits of interest, and they can come from essentially any source, all right? It can come from human DNA, another plant, bacteria, fungus, fish. DNA is DNA. And then we have another piece of DNA that's upstream from that gene called a promoter. 
and the promoter controls when and where the gene is expressed. So these are the sorts of things that Monsanto is interested in, owning the right promoter and getting the right genes to get the right trait. So one of those promoters that was used early on is this cauliflower mosaic virus 35S promoter. So this is a piece of DNA from a virus that has evolved to infect cauliflower and be expressed at high levels in the cauliflower genome. Okay? So it's something that happens out in the real world all the time. Organisms infect other organisms and essentially make them transgenic. And we tap into some of that in nature to do this ourselves. So one way is to use this promoter from the cauliflower mosaic virus. Now people are very interested in more specific control of when only when a, a, an insect is feeding on you or where only in roots or only in leaves. This inducible expression is an example of an insect feeding. That's what turns it on and as long as there's no insect damage, the promoter doesn't go on. The gene that protects from insects doesn't need to be expressed. Um, and then we have these things called terminators, which is another piece of DNA at the end of the gene that says this is the end of the gene. So this is your expression cassette. This is not Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not Terminator technology, okay? In fact, te Terminator technology has never been deployed, just to make sure we understand that. And it's a brilliant technology that actually could be really helpful for presenting, preventing transgene escape or seeds escaping into the environments. But, but the press are the group that actually labeled it Terminator technology when they heard about it, not Monsanto not the company Monsanto was working with, and that bad press was enough for them to stop what was actually a very good, clever idea. So does that exist today? Well, it's a, it's a, it would take me a whole hour to explain how this works, but it is really clever. It's just extreme, let's just leave it at that. It's very clever. Yeah. Okay, so here, you know, I said, it. here's our gene, and then up here, upstream from it is the promoter, and downstream is the terminator here. And then in this case, we have this in a circle of DNA that has been genetically engineered to be expressed in a bacteria, and then the bacteria will insert this piece from the left border to the right border into the plant genome. And so we call this the tDNA, or transfer DNA, because that's the DNA that gets, gets transferred into the plant genome, okay? We do this all the time in my lab. Undergrads working in my lab are making these types of what we call constructs and transforming plants all the time. Okay. In fact, I just an, or, an undergrad just joined my lab who's an organic major. She heard me give this talk and said, I really want to work in your lab. And uh, I think that's great. And I think actually that's, I want all the organic majors to work in my lab, all of them. Um, and I'll explain why at the end. Okay, getting genes into plants. So we've got a couple ways. One way is biologically. And remember I mentioned that bacteria that takes that tDNA and inserts into the genome. The bacteria is called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So a rough a translation of this Latin is, is bacteria that likes plants that makes tumors, okay? And um, what this in the wild does is it inserts a part of its genome into the plant genome and infects the plant. This is in the wild. This is crown gall. We see this in older orchards and older vineyards, all right? So those are all actually transgenic. They're just naturally transgenic, all right? Um, and this piece, of this tDNA, inserts certain genes that express at high levels in the plant genome and they cause the plant to feed the bacteria. So the bacteria infects the plant at a wound site and then makes the plant feed the bacteria, okay? And what scientists have done is remove these quote unquote bad genes and then we can put any genes we want into that tDNA and that's how, they, that's how we insert. Well, the, the bacteria does the work and we, um, we insert that piece of DNA into Agrobacterium and then it does the work. And in my case, with working with Camelina and with Arabidopsis in my lab, we actually make the transgenics just by dipping the flowers in the Agrobacterium and then collect the seeds and one to two percent of them are transgenic. So that's why it's so easy for undergrads to do this. Okay, so there's what, that's what uh, the crown gall looks like here. This is a wild type uh, well, there's a tomato plant that's been infected with wild-type crown gall. Another whole hour, we could do a whole lecture on this story and how this story completely changed the way we work with plants, including genetically engineering plants. But that's for another time. Okay, there's another way, and that's the gene gun. The gene gun actually really was, the original one was a 22 caliber shell with dust shot in it. 
And the dust, though, was not lead, it's gold beads. And you can make gold so fine, you can make it so fine that if you coat the beads with DNA and shoot them into a cell, they'll go in the cell without popping it, without damaging the cell. And then somehow, and we don't know exactly how, we certainly understand much better with agro, somehow that DNA gets incorporated into the genome. So scientists at Cornell that developed the gene gun, in part because Monsanto had locked up agrobacterium mediated transformation, and so they wanted another way so that they could also, that, and then other companies licensed it, but in the case of, of the gene gun, the scientists at Cornell held on to the ability to also use it for their own work, which is not what happened with regard to agrobacterium, okay? And then in both cases, we have a selectable marker which allows us to regenerate these plants and to, de to find which ones are actually transgenic. And in most cases, this is done through tissue culture. Um, I mentioned us dipping our flowers into agro. That's a really easy way, but in most cases, you actually have to do tissue culture coupled with agrobacterium or the gene gun in order to generate a transgenic plant. So let's, here's just an image of the two approaches. Here you've got a bacteria with this piece of DNA. Here you've got gold beads with DNA on them. In either case, you're, we're gonna shoot them into leaf disks. They get incorporated into the genome, and then we're gonna, through tissue culture, regenerate new plants. So let's talk a little bit about tissue culture. So tissue culture is the process of taking a plant cell and differentiate it into callus, that stuff that looks like a crown gall, and then turning it back into another plant. And we do this by altering hormone levels during the process, and it was those hormones that actually are what make the crown gall the crown gall, all right? When you change the ratios, you can take that callus material and make it a leaf, or you use a different ratio of those hormones and make it a root. And we do this out in the field when we take a willow tree and chop it off down to the ground, and the only thing that's left are roots. And that plant will alter its hormones and make new shoots. And we can take those shoots and chop them off, and there's no roots at all, and shove it into the ground. And because of the altered hormone levels at that cut site, that willow stick will make new roots. It's the same process. Okay, now this was originally developed to propagate orchids that were difficult to multiply by sexual reproduction. So these extremely valuable plants, you have one gorgeous orchid that you can sell for a lot of money, chop it up into a thousand little bits and then turn it into a thousand orchids, okay? And so what we've done is we've taken this tissue culture technology and then added in a new foreign piece of DNA along with a selectable marker. So that if the selectable marker is there, then the cells live and if it's not there, they die. So we're just selecting for the ones that have that selectable marker in the transgene. Now, these um, sometimes they encode things like herbicides or antibiotics, resistance to an herbicide or an antibiotic, and, and that can be a problem and something that we, we have to deal with. Um, also, herbicide resistance can be the trait you're putting in, right? So here's just an example of some fresh callus. That's a plant. It doesn't look like one, but indeed it is. It's a rice plant. And then as we go through tissue culture and selection, a lot of this stuff is dying because it's not transgenic, and then these little shoots come out, and those are transgenic, and then we re regenerate a new plant. And then here's a picture of tobacco um, that's being regenerated through tissue culture. So this is tobacco cells here, and then these are tobacco leaves that are coming off of that callus. So um, we talked about health. I mean, if you eat this, will you get cancer? I say no. It's a trick question, I always do this to my students. You will because it's tobacco likely are, but, but not because it's transgenic, just because it's tobacco. Okay, here's some transgenic tobacco plants that I made a long time ago. All right, look at this. So here's a wild type tobacco, and look at these guys. These are little dwarfs. And then here's some purple ones. We inserted a gene that makes them purple. And here we inserted a gene that degrades a growth-promoting hormone. And so you can, depending on which event you have, you can have a semi-dwarf or extreme dwarf. These are beautiful little plants, and you'd never know that was tobacco unless you saw them flower or I told you they were tobacco, okay? And so we had a patent for that, and, and it was basically we could make, you know, modified grass that's slower growing and dark green and drought tolerant. And so then like, this is the title of an article on this. This is from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. You know, that's, Monsanto's there. People are fairly nice in St. Louis. In San Francisco, the title was Geneticist Sows Plot to Kill Lawnmowers, and I got a lot of hate mail from this idea, a lot. So this was in 1999. Um, I've been, yeah, I'll just leave it at that, okay. All right, let's talk about a couple stories and then we'll finish off. So I'm gonna give you four examples of GM uh, crops and, and, and how they have an impact 
on agriculture and the environment. So one is this papaya ring spot mosaic virus or potty virus story. And I think this is one of the great successes of crop biotech and GMO. So papaya is a wonderful, wonderful fruit to eat. It's high in vitamin C and vitamin A. Um, it's a major crop in Hawaii. The problem is that there's this virus called papaya ring spot virus. It's, and it's spread by aphids. Um, and basically the aphid will go in and, and suck on an infected plant and then they'll bring that virus with them in their gut and then suck on an uninfected plant and transfer the virus into that plant. And there's no, at the time when this was coming out, there was no good genetic material for breeding programs to be able to incorporate resistance to this virus into the papaya. And so as a result, it was just destroying papaya production in Hawaii. And one of the ways they dealt with it first was just find clean plants save those, destroy everything else, and move to another island. And that worked for a while, but insects fly, and therefore the virus can move, and eventually it got to another island and continued to infect plants. And so papaya production was going down. So there was a group at Cornell, the people that invented the gene gun, they said, you know, we need to work on this now because that we can do this faster than the breeders can, and, and we need to keep papaya production going in Hawaii. And so what they did was they took a gene or a part of the gene that encoded for the coat protein in the virus. And the virus has a proteins that package it up, right, and that protects the viral DNA. And they thought, you know, if we express this in there, maybe we'll screw up the ability for the virus to make the coat, and it won't, it won't be propagatable. We actually now understand that it's an RNA-mediated silencing of the viral genome is the mechanism, but, but, but nonetheless, here's what happened. Basically, what they did by putting this gene into the papaya, they gave it a vaccination against that virus. And vaccines don't cause autism either, by the way. Okay? Just please. Here's your non-transgenic and there's your transgenic. Here are transgenic plants and non-transgenic. It's pretty obvious which one you want to grow the one that's going to give you healthy looking fruit compared to fruit that looks like this or no fruit at all. So this is a great story. You know, basically they saved papaya production uh, in Hawaii by generating this trait. So almost all of the papaya that's grown in Hawaii is GM, but not all of it. There's actually organic papaya. Well, most of the organic is grown in Mexico right now and the definition of organic is no GM. Um, I guess one of the questions is, do we think the virus is going to ever make it from Hawaii to Mexico? You know, we can't keep our borders closed, all right? And insects could care less what country it is. And they don't have to buy airplane tickets. They just need to get in the cargo hold. So my opinion is, yes, it's going to come there. I think it will. We'll see. But this is the cool thing. So some organic papaya is grown in Hawaii. How? Oh, I think I asked that question next. All right, well, I'm like, reminding you that the definition of, of organic includes no GMO, so how is it possible? How is it possible? Well, I mentioned vaccines, right? And some people won't get vaccinations, but as long as almost everyone else does, then you're good to go. It's called herd immunity. So essentially what they do in Hawaii is they surround an organic field with GM papaya, completely surrounded it. And then the insect can't get in and infect the, the papaya that are organically grown because they can't make it through and live on the GM papaya on the way in. So there's a little bit of irony to that, um, but I'm glad that that's the case. Uh, Hawaii has just passed a bill, 79, for, for on Maui, um, no growing of GM, they, with the exception of papaya. Um, but there are some people that hate GM so much that they actually want to just chop down all the papaya in Hawaii. I think this is going to have a major economic impact, even without the papaya part of the story um, in Maui. Okay, another story is BT toxin. BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, all right? And this is a bacteria that infects plants, I mean, it infects insects that eat plants, basically. And so this bacteria, it infects, it gets into the gut of a lepidopteran, a moth, or a very specific species. Each bacterial strain is, has evolved to a very specific species. And um, those, what they do is they give the insect a, a, a stomach ache, and eventually they die. Bacteria propagates, and then the spores go out, get eaten by another insect, and that's how the bacteria survives. That's how it evolved to survive. Now, 
you can take the bacterial spores or you can take the, um, the, the toxin, that, the actual protein that does the job, which is called the cry protein or crystal protein, and then, and then spray it on plants. And organic has been doing that for a long time because it's natural. It's out there. It's natural already. So it has some advantages. First of all, Bt is highly specific. Not only is it not harmful to other insects, mammals, or fish, but it's species-specific. For that weevil, we have a Bt that will stop that weevil, but not monarch butterflies, OK? So it's a natural product. It's been used since the 60s in organic farming. Um, it reduces the use of chemical pesticides that kill lots of things, not just the one you want to kill. And it breaks down quickly after just a few days, light sensitive. But this can also be a disadvantage because you've got to get your timing right. So the dis here, it's, it's got to be ingested by the insect. And if the insect is a boring insect, a boll weevil, a root weevil, a stem weevil, it doesn't matter how much you spray on the outside. All right, the insect's already inside. You also have to hit it at the larval stage. That's how the biology works. So the timing of application is really important. And of course, no matter what, no matter what you use, even if it's the chemical pesticides, you can lead to resistant insects, resistant weeds, if we're talking about herbicide. That's, that's why breeders are always trying to breed the new disease-resistant variety. That's why in the medical profession, we're always trying to come up with a new antibiotic, right? OK. So what scientists did in this case, and, um, and this was spearheaded by Monsanto and others, was to take that gene and express it in plants. And that actually was, when we talk about millions of dollars in research, it was unbelievable how much work it was to get this to, to, to come to fruition. Again, we could spend a whole hour talking just about the science behind that. And some of my students have been forced to listen to that. But here we've got a non-transgenic tomato plant and a transgenic tomato plant. These guys had a Manduca sexta, a tobacco hornworm introduced to them. This can happen. This damage can happen in four hours. So I would, when we lived in St. Louis, I'd, my tomatoes look beautiful when I go to work. And when I come home, they look like hail hit them. Like there's nothing left. And then I find one big fat horn, this big fat thing with a green thing. So he took a couple bites of this transgenic one, got a stomach ache, and walked over and just ate the good one. OK. Very, so this is an amazing story. And I actually think that traits like this would be very useful for organic agriculture. If, if there are certain crops you just can't grow because we don't have a way to treat for a particular insect or pest in general, then this is something that I think could help organic production. OK, herbicide resistance. Um, now, this one obviously is not going to help organic production because we're talking about using a chemical herbicide. But the particular herbicide is often used in no-till, and I think that there's, there are certain areas where this can help sustainability and crop production. So Roundup Ready, we're talking about Roundup Ready. So one of the things is, especially when, when diesel prices are high, reduced tillage is a big deal, right? Fewer passes in your field. Less tilling, reduced management. Well, this is from 2003, but the point is, is that you save money in weed management costs, decrease overall herbicide use. And then even though you have to pay a premium for those seeds, you're willing to do that because of the profit that comes back with regard to inputs and being able to deal with a weed problem in one of your fields. So here's, these are Roundup uh, resistant sugar beets. And this is an experiment where these guys, half the field was sprayed with Roundup and the other half wasn't. And you can see that, the, you know, you don't want to see that, right? You want to see this. Now, Roundup resistant crops don't increase yield, all right? They're, but what they do is they lower the operating costs per yield. And that's important when people are saying, oh, but there's no higher yielding because of this. No, but we can get more for less inputs by using this particular trait. And this has been around for quite a while. And so when something's been in the field for, say, 10 years, then people can start to ask scientific questions like, what does the water that runs off of uh, glyphosate or glufosinate tolerant corn fields compared to those fields where we're working with tillage and atrazine or alichlor, OK? And so what they found was, this is a 10-year study, that in the atrazine and alichlor fields, the runoff had up to, 204, up to 240 times higher than the drinking water standard for atrazine, or up to 700 times higher for alichlor. I'll be very clear here, I'm talking about up to, because that's not all fields are like that. And if you use these chemicals correctly, then you're pretty good. Things are going to be fine. But some people say, well, I just need to dump more on there. I have a real resistance problem. And that's just when we start to get into these issues. Um, the maximum, so not up to, the maximum glyphosate concentration was four times lower than the standard. 
And in the case of glufosinate, when this study was published in 2008, there was no established standard, but it was undetectable after 80 days. Now there's a couple things going on here in, these, in this case with glyphosate and glufosinate. They're binding the clay particles. They're getting broken down by bacteria, but you've also got reduced tillage, and so you're getting less runoff just from the reduced tillage alone, okay? So I think this is something that we don't want to get rid of. That's my opinion. But there are problems, and I already mentioned this with resistance to insects, but we can have problems with you know, weed resistance. Obviously, this is a big deal. It's been in the news lately. There's also other problems that, that, that is not in the news, but is certainly something that farmers have to deal with, and that is in your rotations, if you've got Roundup-resistant soybean, then it's volunteering in your Roundup-resistant corn. You can't get rid of the soybean unless you use something else, right? And here we've got two different varieties of corn, say. Um, you've got, say, one that's going to be used for feed and another that's going to be used for human consumption, and we've got to keep these market classes separate, and that can be a challenge, okay? Which means the things like rotations, and really, I think, personally, we need more than just a couple. We need as many herbicide-resistant traits as we can so that we can rotate the herbicides we use as well as rotate the crops that we use. And that's my opinion. So I promised you I would tell you a story that, of a bad idea. And actually, this is really close to me. So you know, I showed you what that patent with the dark green dwarf plants. Scott's Turf Company became very interested, and they licensed that patent and uh, non-exclusively. And um, I ended up getting about $5,000. And after I paid Uncle Sam, I had some money left over, bought a really nice guitar, and then gave the rest to my wife and kids. And so if you ever go on YouTube and you can see me singing to my class playing this guitar. It's all carbon graphite. There's no wood at all on it. It's acoustic guitar. It's called a rain song. It's made in Woodenville, Washington, right? But, but there's no wood. Uh, um, but nonetheless, so I, was, I, I got this money from Scotts, and then they wanted to hire me as a consultant. Um, and so I went out to their facility and talked with them about you know, what they're doing, and we were trying to figure out if it would be a good idea for me to be a consultant with them. And, and I said, you know, you know, it's really great the stuff you're doing and I'd love to work with you guys on all of this. And, uh, but I really think that I have some advice for you, which would be don't, don't make Roundup Ready keep creeping bent grass. I think that's not a good idea. And uh, so they did. It's used on golf courses. So they read it, they made, it's, it's creeping bent grass in golf courses is for tee boxes and putting greens. But it becomes a weed when it's in the fairways, right? It's this stuff, you can, you can mow it down to where it looks like you just painted green on plywood. Um, so, and it's open pollinated, right? So before we go any further on this slide, when they were trying to hire me as a consultant, the contract that they gave me had an indemnification clause. Does anybody know what those are? So basically, this particular one was that I was personally financially responsible for any bad advice I gave them. Personally financially responsible. That would bankrupt me, right? That's worse than not having health insurance. I mean, that's just not a good idea. And so I showed it to the lawyers, and are there any lawyers in the room? The lawyers, like, they spit up their coffee through their nose when they read that, which was really entertaining, you know, and they handed it back to me and said, no way in hell, don't ever sign this. And so I went to Bob Harriman at Scott's and said, I, this is ridiculous. And he goes, oh, that's just boilerplate. We'll fix that. Don't worry about that. We'll fix that. And so they moved it from page six to page 60, okay? And, and, and it's a searchable document. And so I searched for the phrases and bam, there they were still. And so I said, no, I will not work with you, but I'll give you one piece of free advice. Don't make Roundup Ready creeping bent grass. And they didn't listen to me and they did it anyhow. And they had test plots in Oregon. This is open pollinated. And there's weedy populations all over the place. And so of course, what happened? We all know what happened, right? The transgene escaped into the neighboring weeds. And it gets worse than that. It escaped into the seed plot, neighboring seed plot fields. Now the most valuable ground out there is certified ground for growing certified seeds, right? That's some big money. And Scott's had to buy up all those surrounding fields. So first USDA APHIS comes out and sees what they're doing and Scott's is really proud of how awesome they are and they just, uh, the APHIS guys just start writing violation out of violation, as to get out of their truck and they just start writing stuff down, right? And so 
Scott's got fined a half a million dollars. I told them not to do this. I, I don't know how, I, somehow I wish that they owe me money, but it just doesn't work that way. So they had to buy up all the fields around too, and that didn't, that wasn't half a million. We're talking about millions of dollars. And they've got to take those things out and show that they are GM free before they'll sell them back. And will they sell them back for the price they paid? No, no. But they're not even there yet because those weeds got into the drainage ditches around those fields. And the times when they could apply something to kill the Roundup Ready Creeping Bent Grass, they can't apply it because of the water restriction and issues with runoff and salmon and so forth. So they're having a really hard time dealing with this mistake. They now have made a Roundup Ready Kentucky Bluegrass, which is not open pollinated. And they've done it in a clever way where they don't have to go through all the expensive testing. Um, so they don't even have to deal with USDA APHIS. And that, maybe that product will work for them and it's less likely, certainly, not completely unlikely, but less likely that that will escape into the environment. Okay, a couple things to think about and crop issues to watch. One, I'd already mentioned this Bill 79, which promotes, prohibits GM seed production and, and breeding in Maui, with the exception of GM papaya. Monsanto's already suing them, or what multiple companies are, and they're also getting ready to just pull all of their seed production and breeding facilities out of there, and that's going to be a loss of a lot of money for the state of Hawaii. This is the game changer right here. This citrus greening disease, this is a bacterial disease of citrus. There's no natural resistance. So this sounds a lot like the papaya story. And this is a major threat in Florida, oranges in Florida. So there's people at WSU that are working with remote sensing and different ways to figure out as you drive by your orchards which trees are infected and which ones aren't so you can chop them down before it spreads to other trees. Now the insect vector has been found in California though the bacteria has not yet. And at, at Texas A&M, they have a candidate transgene resistance. The reason I say I think this is a game changer is because it very well may be that we can't grow citrus without them being transgenic. You know, I just finished reading this awesome book about she sheep uh, uh, herding in, in Hell's Canyon. And these kids, you know, this is in the 1800s, and what do they get in their stocking at Christmas back then? What we also still get in our stocking now, if it's not coal, it's an orange, right? So I think this is a big deal. Now, uh, Okanagan uh, Specialty Fruits up in BC has developed Arctic Apple, which is right here on the right compared to a non-transgenic that doesn't brown when it's been sliced. And so that it has, for slicing apples, you, it has a longer uh, storage uh, shelf life. Um, at WSU, there are, are groups that are working on gluten-free wheat or wheat that could be uh, consumed by people with celiac disease or, or gluten um, allergies. And then golden rice down here, this is uh, increasing the vitamin A content in rice. This is a big deal. Um, and vitamin A deficiency leads to uh, over a million deaths per year and 200 million people with deficiency. Greenpeace is absolutely opposed to golden rice being deployed. And they say that even though it would be a great thing, that particular trait, they don't want to open the floodgates for all the other bad things that GMs do. Here's an opinion I have. I don't support Greenpeace or the Sierra Club anymore because of their anti-GM stance. I think that they've taken that stance in order to get people to give them money. Um, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I think might be going on there. And I just think that's unethical. And quite frankly, to stop something like this from going out into the world is, like, to be blunt, you have blood on your hands. Okay. I think there's just two slides left. The anti-GMO quandary. I hope, I hope that I've gotten across one take-home message, which is that GMOs can be safe and effective, okay? But there's a lot of people that even after we have this discussion, they say, okay, I got it. I hate Monsanto. I just hate Monsanto or Monsatan. Or if you Google the most evil company in the world, Monsanto comes up, okay? Here's the problem. Well, if these guys don't want Monsanto to be successful, this approach is not working. In fact, it's actually helping Monsanto succeed. Now, the first one is we are completely drunk at this point because I've said that word so many times. And this is the trivial one. It's free ad advertisement from Monsanto. Of course, they don't want that. They would rather that's not the case, all right? But the real issue is this, is that 
the heavy amount of testing. So the testing is for each transgenic event, not the trait, but the event, the one event in that corn variety has to be tested ad nauseum and is way more than anything that's made through breeding, which is not tested at all, other than for the qualities that you're breeding for, but not for safety, okay? So that amount of money that has to go into getting something out there allows Monsanto to be the major player, one of the major players. And it prevents universities from deploying products that could help society or compete with Monsanto. And it prevents small companies from doing that. So basically, they've locked it up. Now, there is, you know, Monsanto could be the only ones, but that's not going to happen because of antitrust laws. But they like the fact that this is something that they have a lot of control over. They actually lobby for governmental regulations on this. <clears throat> okay, before I look to the future, I want to say one other thing about this, though. One of the techniques that we're working on in my lab is called DNA editing. So it uses transgenes to bring in these tools that will go and target a very specific gene and switch some nucleotide sequences in there. And then we can remove those transgenes because they're not the trait. It was the switching of the nucleotides that is the trait. And that's not right now, it's not considered GMO. That's a game changer. A lot of these companies want that to be considered GMO because then people like me can't go out and make a larger seed that can be planted deeper in dry soil, which they're not going to work on because there's not enough acres with that problem, right? Wire worm resistance, they're not going to work on that because there's not enough acres with that problem. So I think that they think that things really are going to change in the next couple of years, and we're right on the forefront of that, and very excited to be doing those. We may very well be the first lab at WSU to use this technique. Okay, so let's look to the future. Second to last slide. Organic definition includes GMO free. I think one of the questions we need to ask is, can GM approaches help organic farmers? I think it's a very important question to ask. Can GM approaches facilitate sustainable farming and sustainable living? I think that's something that, I know sustainable is not necessarily the best word because it implies that we're not doing, so we're doing something right. But the real, can we do a better job of farming with GM? I think it's something we need to ask. Can GM approaches help remove dependence on fossil fuels? A couple years ago, people really were very interested in that question. Right now, prices of gas are down so low, but it's not going to stay that way forever. It's certainly not. Can an open source approach be used with GMOs? So with computer programming, there are groups that will write a program, and then they will give the program to someone else as long as that person agrees that once they've improved on it or worked on it, that they will freely give it to everyone else. That's the open source model, and it's a completely different kind of model, but it would allow universities to, of course, patents are finite. They're only 20 years, and we're already benefiting from that now. But an open source approach might be something worth considering, and there are people that are talking about that. And I think all this should be open to discussion. Now, the last slide is as much for me as it is for anyone else, and that is just reminding myself that it's important to empower through education but don't expect attitude changes. I'm not speaking to the people that are completely pro, that's preaching to the choir, and I'm not speaking to the people that refuse to ever even consider anything else because they're not going to. I'm talking to people that want to learn and make a decision based on knowledge, okay? Be, be passionate and stay committed even when people yell at you and walk out. Be credible and listen to what people have to say. That's really important. It's important to adapt to your audience. I have spoken to the tilth producers of Washington. It's a very different audience than this. Pullman League of Women Voters is different. Sandhill Crane Festival, I go back every year and talk to the bird watchers. And now the master gardeners want me to talk about this. I did the yearly conference in Tacoma last fall, and I've had three invitations to smaller conferences because of that. Be aware of your effects. So I tried to temper my intro this time because I got someone pretty mad at me last time. Use all channels to communicate, even the internet, and, and collaborate with others. And so that, because nothing's done in a vacuum, right? We, we can't do this alone. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for listening to this story, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, so the question is, does it take twice the amount of time to put the bacteria in and then remove it? Is that doubling the effort? It takes more time. It's genetics. It's not that hard to do. It takes us a couple more generations. But once we're done and we go through licensing or 
plant protection variety, whatever it is, we can go with that. It's just breeding. Whereas it could take me 10 years of testing if I used a transgene approach. So it actually takes less time in the long run. It's just more time up front. But that's an excellent question. Thank you. We're, we've, it's, it's a new technology that no one even knew about when the politics was established. So it's true that even in the case of organic, um, when GMs first came out, we didn't know whether they were safe or not. And so the, the idea was just to say no GM for organic. We now have a very different understanding than then. So I, it's not, politics is fluid. Yeah, I'm trying to get around Monsanto and the lack of me ability to do something that I would really love to do for society. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, you had a question. Right, so the, and this is actually, I get this a lot when I talk with crop production services. They say, you know, how do you, what advice do you have for us to be able to talk with our friends and families that are adamantly opposed to this? Um, well, don't, don't yell, right? That's a really good one. Um, there are some very good web pages out there and resources. One is GMO Answers, and I would highly recommend going there. Now, some people will say, but that's sponsored by these companies. And it's the companies are trying to get the answers by scientists. They're not being paid to do it, but the website and everything else is being put together by companies. But there's some really good information out there. Um, I, think, I think what you do is you talk about the stories that I've told you and don't expect people to change their mind. And uh, you just gotta keep having the conversation. I think that's the most important thing. Any other questions? Yes, and see that, so why are there so many countries that are against GMOs and do we see that attitude changing? This is a really complicated question. And the reason is, is because some of these decisions are probably being made for political reasons that have to do with importing and uh, importing from other countries. So that's one. Another is misinformation, all right? There are some people out there that are tr spreading a tremendous amount of misinformation and being paid a lot of money to do that. One would be Food Babe. Another one is, oh, uh, I can't remember her name from India. Vandata Shiva. She makes a ton of money going all around telling people how evil Monsanto is and how bad GMOs are. And um, it's easy to scare people. Images, Photoshop is a great way to scare people. And I think a lack of knowledge causes people to get really up in arms. Now, Great Britain was opposed, and now they're changing their tune. Mark Linus uh, is a champion now of this discussion. And he was one of the anti-GMO people that was really doing some nasty things. And then realized when he stepped back that the science did not support any of the beliefs that he had. So I think as long as we continue to have this conversation and certain events that will, like citrus greening disease, these are the kinds of combination of these two things that are gonna, that will turn some groups around. But it's very, very complicated. A lot of it has to do with countries and borders. You had a question, yes. Okay, so the question is, first is the observation that, that a, a lot of the opposition to this is people being worried about GM field being grown next to a non-GM or organic field. And I tried to touch on that a little bit earlier. What do you say to people, you know, when they, so that, let's, let's take that, I'm gonna expand that question a little bit more. So first of all, I did mention that if GM pollen comes across into your organic field, it's not gonna change the organic rating for your crop. If you plant GM, it will, but if some gets in there, the word contamination is used a lot, that's not gonna change that crop, okay? Now, when I start to expand this, people say, well, what about if seeds you know, get into your field and then you don't knowingly, you, know, you, you don't realize that they're Monsanto seeds and then you grow them and then Monsanto sues you. And so Percy Smizer is, this is the story, this is the classic story there. Now, he lost that, that lawsuit because he knew it was Monsanto's seed, and he was spraying his fields with Roundup. So he was actually knowingly propagating those seeds. And that's why Monsanto sued him. They are not suing farmers that accidentally grow their stuff. And people are not getting shut down because GM pollen accidentally drifted over into your field. 
Um, in his case, if you go to his website, he'll say the man who beat Monsanto because he had a small countersuit where he won something like $2. And, and, and so, but the big suit, he lost that. He was knowingly propagating those seeds. Um, I guess along the same kind of question, people will say, well, what about not being able to save your seeds anymore? We hear that a lot, right? I, most, a lot of people will save their seeds. Um, when you buy this Monsanto's Roundup Ready corn, you agree not to, and you have to follow that, and you also make other agreements, or they can sue you. That's a contract that you get into with them, and you have to stick to that contract. But um, uh, so many of these crops now are either hybrid, and so you're not going to save those seeds anyhow, or you, were, you pay more for certified seeds, but you know that you're getting a weed-free healthy, good germinating. So it's, it's some of these questions and concerns that people have is based on a lack of knowledge about agriculture. And I think having just being able to teach people a little bit about how agriculture works is a huge start. Huge start. Yes? Okay, so in the case, the question was how much pollen does wheat have to blow into other fields? Okay, so if we're talking about, so first of all, I don't know the answer, probably a lot, but enough to, to take care of pollination. But mostly, if you just leave wheat alone, it's gonna self-pollinate, all right? It's, you gotta actually do a cross. You have to emasculate a plant and then go in and add pollen, so most of the time, it's gonna, it's gonna be by itself. The wheat that got out into the field in Eastern Oregon, that wasn't from pollen getting there, that was from seed getting there. And we don't know where that's, how that seed got there. Um, there's a lot of speculation, but we don't know how the seed got there. But that was, that's not a pollen issue. Okay? So in the case of creeping bent grass, that pollen goes somewhere else and pollinates over there. It's, will not, it doesn't self-pollinate. It likes to outcross. Wheat and corn likes to outcross. Wheat likes to self-pollinate, okay? like peas do too lentils and garbs. Any other questions? Time for one more. Will we ever get acceptance to GMOs? We're getting more acceptance, I think. And I think that uh, as we have these conversations and people start to actually learn that some of the misconceptions that they have are not true, then uh, that helps work in that direction. Uh, no, I know human nature pretty much dictates that we'll never have 100% acceptance of anything. But I think we're going in the right direction. Um, and and it's, it's venues like this that help us get there. So that's my plug for anyone getting out and talking to other people about this. I think it's very important. Um, okay, with that, again, I want to thank you all for the excellent questions and uh, listening.